Greetings, friends, and welcome to this edition of Tales from the Tabletop, a video series where I scour the internet, my own personal experiences, to bring you anecdotes of adventure. The fun, the funny, the farcical, and the highly improbable. I take my favorite one, and I illustrate it for your listening and viewing pleasure. And today's main story definitely falls under the highly improbable, so much so that of of course I had to draw something for it. But before we get into the main story, there is a brief thread from the lighthearted section of r slash RPG horror stories about edgelords that is too funny and has truly inspired me. And here we go. The title of the thread is Brooding. Edgelord walks into a tavern, and says, I'll go and brood in the corner. The GM says, no, you can't. The room is an oval. Edgelord says, That's fine. I'll just make do with the floor. Peak Edgelord. That's perfect. That is perfect. A cartoon character who knows that they're a cartoon character. That is where I live. That is where the most fun, funny, and joy happens for me. And the, the comments... First comment, I heard of a rogue once who brought a pop-up corner along with him, so he always had a corner to brood in. Beautiful. Perfect. Amazing. Another commenter, my very first campaign, every single player character introduced before mine said that they stood in the back of the tavern, watching the room with their arms crossed. I was going to say the same thing, but after about four of them said that, I decided my PC was going to sit down and enjoy himself like a person. <clears throat> Which is another excellent reason to play these games, just these moments of like, you know what? Uh, I, choose, I choose maturity. This is the moment where I grow up just a little bit and realize that it's kind of insane to walk into a public place just to sit away from everyone and pretend like I don't want to be there. You don't want to be there, don't be there. I digress. Adventure Townie, still a cool name, hits us with this beautiful gem that I will take with me forever. Uh, Adventure Townie writes, Sufficiently advanced brooding is indistinguishable from shyness. Hats off, Adventure Townie. Well said. Now, the very last comment from Grixit, which is a cool name and I will be stealing it. It sounds like a goblin name, so uh, thanks, Grixit. One of my campaigns, I had an innkeeper who hated adventurers. Hated them so much, he had his common room built in such a way that one cannot avoid having one's back to a door. That kind of pettiness, that kind of trolling, that subtle little... Ah, oh, I live for that. So good. Well done, Grixit. Let's dig into the main event. This story is about one of the most improbable dice-rolling adventures that I have ever heard of or read. And the reason why, at the very end, just... I felt the player's anguish. So here we go. This story isn't about a problem player or an asshole DM... It's not about bad writing or a conflict of personalities. It's about the night the dice made an earnest effort to annihilate the party. This story is called Dice Jail. Pathfinder. Three players, fighter, druid, and sorcerer. I was the DM. Druid was the host. Started off okay made some taquitos, spent a half hour BSing, and then began. We were in the middle of a campaign. The player characters were running across a country to bring a cursed artifact to a temple to foil the big bad's plan. They left a roadhouse just before the dawn and were trying to cut through a forest to save time. I had just compiled a new random encounter chart and decided to try it out. So as fate would have it, the party was set upon by wild owl bears. Kind of an interesting result. I was having them sneak up on the player characters, so I called for spot checks. They rolled natural one, natural one, modified six. Um, alright, uh, 
roll to listen. A seven, a nine, a natural one. They needed a ten. Oh boy, here we go. So we have a surprise round where the monsters begin to make attacks on the party while everyone is caught flat-footed. It doesn't really go well. The sorcerer went down, taking a natural 20 from an owl bear. The damage was pretty good, too. This group never was one to run away from an encounter, but they very quickly found themselves in a tight spot and they hadn't even got to their own actions yet. I had them roll for initiative. They rolled a six, an eight, and the sorcerer is already unconscious. The owl bears rolled a 17, a 19, and a 21. This was starting to get ridiculous, and I really didn't want to have a total party kill with how far we had gotten with this campaign, and especially not from a random encounter. So I quickly thought about it and realized that Fighter's armor class was 18. He still had more than three quarters of his hit points, and he got three attacks per round. I had the owlbear that downed the sorcerer disengage and go after the fighter. The fighter was close enough to the druid that it really wasn't much of a stretch to have that particular monster turn his attention to the fighter as well. I wish I was making this next part up because this next part is where the players began to question all of their life choices. The Owl Bears rolled to attack. 18, 19, 19, 20, 22, 22, 23. Yes, I did not give the third Owl Bear its remaining attacks because I hadn't rolled the damage yet and the fighter's player wore an expression on his face as though someone kicked a puppy in front of him. I started rolling for damage, actually holding my breath as I did it. The rolls were high and I began to sweat. When they finish their turn, fighter is still up, but he is a hurting unit. There is absolutely no way he would survive another battery of those attacks. Sorcerer's player asks, rather grumpily, if these were the numbers I was actually rolling and not something I was pulling out of my ass. I assured him that they know I would never do anything like that intentionally. Druid was deep in thought as Fighter took his turn. So as a brief aside, I'm a big, big advocate for rolling on the other side of the screen. Roll where your players can see it, specifically for this. Now, for guys like me, for, for my age, the, the amount that I've been playing, rolling in front of the screen was kind of considered an advanced move for DMs uh, because, you know, sometimes the DMs would make encounters that they didn't realize were unbalanced and so would, like, have to fudge some numbers. Um, nope, can't do it. Even if it feels like an advanced move, I, I advocate strongly. If you're new to this and you're DMing or GMing for the first time, anytime you roll some dice, it's in front of the players. Always roll in front of the players, especially at a table where they don't necessarily know you yet. The fighter took his turn. A modified 14, modified nine, natural one. What the hell is going on here? The fighter shouts. I tell him to re-roll that one. I use a modified critical fumble table that I had for a very long time, and I really didn't want to make the risk even greater. I don't want the fighter to lose his weapons as a result. But he rolls another one. Without me saying anything, he re-rolls again, and this time he rolls Two. Fighter just crosses his arms and declares that his turn is over. Without even looking up from the player's handbook, Druid declares his action. I wild shape into a rock. Um, for those of you who don't know or need the refresher, a rock, R-O-C, is a very large eagle-like bird. Uh, in the second edition Monsters Manual for scale, it is carrying an elephant in its talons. I think I see what the druid was trying to do. So I said, okay, are you gonna grab the other two and escape? 
Yes, that is exactly what I intend to do. Fighter and Sorcerer both breathe a sigh of relief as I explain that the druid successfully transforms. I don't even have him roll to grapple or grab the two party members. He declares that he is going to beat his wings and try to get as high up out of the forest as he possibly can. I tell him to make a fly check. What now? To which, at this point in the stories, I think, what now? As well, but... In Pathfinder 1.0, there is a fly skill purely for things like this. Just because you can wild shape or polymorph into a creature that can fly does not automatically mean that you know how to do it. That's why it was included in the character sheet. So I get that like for Pathfinder, this is it's, it's baked into the rules. This is part of the flavor of the game that you would need to make this roll. Ah. I, given these circumstances, I think that's kind of slim. I'd have just said, yeah, you grab them and you go. Uh, the dice have decided they freaking hate you. I'm not going to wait for the law of averages to swing back in the middle of this fight. Just grab them and go. But this is what happens. Roll a fly check. The animal can fly, so it's not going to be a difficult one, but you still have to make a roll. The druid blinks a couple of times and looks down at the character sheet. What do I use for that? It's a skill, and I believe it is dex-based. Druid says, I, I don't have any points in it. Well, your dexterity bonus is a plus two, right? I'm not even going to make it difficult to beat. Just give it a shot. Natural one. I am absolutely not kidding. The three players lose it and I start loudly cursing. I demand the druid re-roll it. And he did, for an adjusted five. At this point, I get mad. I tell druid to re-roll it one more time. The number he needed originally was a 15, but I have lowered it to eight. And the druid rolls an adjusted seven. I tell the druid he can have one more shot and he just shakes his head. He tells me that he should have better hit points now that he is in the form of a giant bird and that he's just going to wrap his wings around the other two to keep them safe until, quote, the dice stop being a-holes. Begrudgingly, I have the monsters go again and it comes out just as bad as it did in the last turn. If the druid didn't get extra hit points from Wild Shape, he would have died. I was even so personally upset that I started rolling my dice in the open so the other players could see what I was rolling and that I wasn't making this up. That's why you gotta start in front of the screen. Start in front of the screen, remove even the possibility from the mind of your players. It's a psychological thing. And the number one thing it'll do for you and your table, you're not the enemy. Like, it's, it's an old, old trope. It's the players versus the DM. Old trope. When you roll in front of the players, the dice are the enemy not the DM. It's the dice and the characters and the DM is playing with the players, especially if the DM is rolling and saying, oh geez, I hope this doesn't go bad. It binds all the players closer together and builds trust in your DM and GM and these games run on trust. But I digress. This was really not shaping up to be very good and I had to do something. Unless Druid could pass a fly check, or if I let him fly without making a check, I would still have to pull a deus ex machina just to... Wait, that's it! Fighter ended up spending his turn withholding his action until the monsters had breached through the Druid's wings, and Druid tried casting spells to try and revive the sorcerer. When the monsters got their action, Suddenly, out of the dim light of the early morning, a bolt of lightning blasts one of the owl bears, doing a significant amount of damage. I did not make the players roll for the spot because reasons. 
So I told them that the source of a lightning was an adult blue dragon emerging from its cave to find out what all the noise was. The owl bears immediately turn their attention to the dragon and I do a round of combat between them. I haven't even finished rolling damage when the druid asks, can I just pretend it's a 20 on the fly check? Yes, of course you can. For the love of hell, you take a 20 on the fly check and you get them all out of there. At this point in time, we decided to take a break and do a quick drive into town to get some drinks and pick up more snacks. We sort out the stuff at the table, and the druid begins to put my dice back into my oversized box so that his cat doesn't lose any of them while we are gone. Same. But druid notices something. Are you sure you didn't do this on purpose? We all look, and the druid is holding a purple d20 that was on the player's side of the screen for the whole session. We sat there, staring at it for a minute until it suddenly hit me. Way back at the local game store, I bought a set of gag dice to prank my brother. One of the d20s had the one replaced with another 20, and the other had a 20 replaced with a 1. Guess which D20 Fighter and Druid had been using this whole time. That's why you gotta bring your own dice, man. With that sorted out, I apologized and have since removed both of them from my dice box, not even realizing that they had found their way in there in the first place. We talked the whole drive into town about how crazy the dice rolls were, and we agreed we should probably not play any more Pathfinder for the rest of the night. We tried again the next day, and the player's luck was significantly better. I did eventually get one of those little 3D printed dice jails, and the one that sits in my game room has one very specific permanent occupant. And I'm sure you can guess which one it is. Now, here's where the illustration comes from. Best comment comes from Cy McDeath, who gives a great idea that I wanna share with everyone watching and listening. If you wanna take your dice jail game up or your dice dunce chair game up one notch, this is for you. Cy McDeath comments, until I got to the gag dice, I was about to suggest a dice witch trial which is something I did in the past for repeatedly offending player killing dice. How it is done. You glue the offending dice to a toothpick. Place that toothpick on a candle so that the die is directly above the flame. Take the candle and all other dice outside and light it. Have the other dice see the price of treachery. The fear will keep them in check. And it's always a blast for the party. And I can imagine it is if I was somebody, I would straight up burn that gag die. Just, if I was the DM and I had made that mistake and my dice were behind the screen, I would feel like, all right, we need, the, the players clearly had a moment where it's like, we can't, I, that was such a roller coaster, it was such a rough ride, I can't hang right now. In fact, I don't think I can hang anymore tonight. Uh, a great catharsis to get over it, maybe even keep the game going that night, is this burning at the stake uh, described by Cy McDeath. And the image was so beautiful in my head. Of course, that's what I had to draw for this video. I enjoyed drawing it very much because the shapes were so simple. I figured, cool, I could take the time on the hatching and make it, you know, kind of gritty and dark and uh, look like something that would be in like a, uh, an illustration, like a, a little vertical illustration in a column in a rules book. Uh, and if ever anybody is making their own game and you want to license this image for that very purpose, reach out. I'd, I'd love to. Um, and I, I just, I love this image so much, and I think I'm going to, in the future, make more variations on this theme, and uh, I will title it, The Price of Treachery. If you like the original art from this episode, you can find it in my store on my website at coffeeandhate.biz. Click store at the top, and if it's there, it's still for grabs. 
In the meantime, thank you so much for watching, thank you for listening, may your dice roll high and never be cursed, and if they are cursed, show them the price of treachery.